Can you see my screen? Yes, Professor. Okay. Okay, um, fine, let's begin. Um, diseases of the breast, that's our topic today. Um, so we can think of breast pathology in under these four groups, um, inflammatory lesions, non-neoplastic lesions, of which there are a number, and then tumors and a variety of miscellaneous lesions. So we'll probably spend more time on the first three. Uh, just to remind ourselves um, the anatomy and microanatomy of the breast. Uh, we have the collecting ducts that come out of the nipple um, and progressively um, down lactiferous sinuses, segmental ducts, subsegmental. And then the most important unit is the terminal ductular unit. And this is really where most of the stuff happens, the terminal uh, duct lobular unit. Um, so just some general comments. Uh, lesions are more common in the female breast than the male breast for obvious reasons. There's more physiological activity, uh, cyclic proliferation, and um, and uh, then the, goes, the breast goes on um, a sort of a resting phase, uh, very similar uh, mirroring the cyclic um, hormonal influence um, from the ovary, uh, estrogen um, uh, influence, and then uh, the other, the pituitary hormones. Um, often, um, breast lesions will present as nodules or masses, which may be tender. And uh, it's not always true that, in fact, breast cancer often or neoplastic lesions of the breast are generally uh, pretty innocuous in terms of clinical presentation. Uh, rarely are they painful until late in the disease. So that is something you should be aware of. Uh, your patients will also will almost always say, but it's not paining. Yes, there is a lump there, but it's not paining. Yeah, but the when it pains, most likely it's an inflammatory lesion. When it's quiet and just a lump there, it may be very well be malignant. Um, Luckily, most breast lumps um, or nodules are innocent. And of course, you know that uh, breast cancer is the commonest cause of cancer deaths among women worldwide. And from the chart I showed you uh, last week, um, the, from our KNH uh, medical records, breast and cervix um, almost commit, compete for first place in terms of the most common cancer recorded. So this is um, a survey from a London hospital. Um, if you walk down the corridor on our, on our walls, um, there's a, a survey we did uh, some years back during the Breast Cancer Awareness Month uh, in Mata Hospital and showed what are the commonest um, presentations of uh, breast lumps um, that we saw for that particular year. Um, for this uh, survey in a London hospital, you can see that majority, 40%, were fibrocystic changes. A significant 30% were women who thought they had breast, uh, a breast lesion actually didn't have any disease. 13% were a miscellaneous group of um, benign lesions. 10%, uh, which is significant, meaning one out of 10 women who come in to hospital with a breast complaint, one out of 10 
um, may likely, most likely be cancer, and 7% were fibroadenomas. And of course, this is also influenced by the age group, population age group. So for us, uh, it may be very well be different uh, than from um, a London hospital population. So let's, what are the minor lesions that you may see? Supernumerary nipples. Um, some women may come with the supernumerary nipples or, or even accessory breasts in, in a variety of places, usually along the milk line or even in the axilla. You know, they go all the way into the axilla. Um, and generally these are curiosities, but they may have problems. Like if there's significant breast tissue, um, the, this may also give rise to um, the same pathology that you would see in um, the normal breast. Congenital inversion of the nipple. Um, the, generally, um, not a problem except uh, as a dif in the older woman as a differential for cancer because one of the presentations of cancer is uh, retracted nipple. Um, and of course, in breastfeeding, that it, it may be difficult. She may need help with uh, inverting the nipple so she can uh, successfully breastfeed. The lactosil, which is a cystic dilatation of an obstructed duct um, occurring, I'm sorry about the typo, occurring during lactation. Uh, it's often painful, uh, may rupture. Uh, and incite a local inflammatory reaction or a local mastitis. And the persistent induration may cause concerns of a, a breast lesion later on, particularly a neoplastic uh, lesion. So let's look at the non-neoplastic lesions of the, of the breast. And the biggest group, as I showed you in that London survey, and it's true also for us in our population, is um, fibrocystic changes. And this is um, a collection of changes in the female breast that range from innocuous to those that are associated with significant risk for breast cancer. And the unifying feature of this group of uh, diseases is that they present with breast lungs. And the accepted theory is that it's a consequence of uh, exaggerated distortion of the cyclic changes of the breast in the normal menstrual cycle. So because the changes wax and wane with the cycle, and that's why it's thought that uh, it's just an exaggerated uh, response to hormonal uh, influence. Uh, fortunately, majority have little clinical significance, but a small percentage have are clinically significant, and we'll see which category this is in a little bit. So you will see fibrocystic changes referred to as with different names in, in literature. Um, currently, we, we really talk about fibrocystic disease, uh, but you may see it referred to as cystic mastopathy, although this is really discouraged. Um, uh, mastopathy was when we really didn't know what the etiology was. And we can arbitrarily divide it into non-proliferative fibrocystic changes and proliferative changes because of the uh, um, histological changes that go with each category. Uh, so the non-proliferative changes is basically characterized by cysts and stromofibrosis. It's the most common type of changes that you will see. Um, and um, it may generally be a single cyst, which may measure one to five centimeters in diameter. So uh, a whole range of um, sizes. Um, changes are often bilateral and multifocal. Um, clinically, they feel ill-defined and diffuse and give rise to an increase in the density and nodularity of the breast. So if one or both breasts are irregularly nodular and, um, and dense, then most likely it's non-proliferative or fibrocystic changes, most likely non-proliferative changes. The unopened cysts may be 
uh, brown or blue, depending on the fluid that is contained. And that's why sometimes it may be referred to as blue dome disease. But again, this is really, we, we don't use this term very often. So the cysts may be filled with the serous turbid fluid. Uh, they may calcify with time. Um, so that they appear as microcalcification on mammogram, which again, radiologically gives rise to the differential diagnosis of malignancy. Um, microscopy, the cysts are lined by cuboidal to columnar epithelium, which may be multi-layered, may be flattened or totally atrophic. There may even be micropapillary excrescences. And uh, frequently the epithelium shows apocrine changes. Um, and this apocrine change is almost always a benign change. Um, the stroma then is compressed by all these cystic uh, spaces into dense fibrous connective tissue. Um, there may be a variable lymphocytic infiltration in almost all variants of fibrocystic uh, changes, um, but this is inconsistent and it's purely a, a host reaction. And of course, if there is rupture of a cyst, then there is um, a brisk uh, lymphocytic or inflammatory cell response around the, the cyst. In the peripherative changes, I'll show you pictures uh, uh, soon so that you see what I'm talking about. Um, there's a range of peripherative lesions in the ducts, um, the ductules and lobules. Remember the terminal duct lobular unit? This is where most of it happens. Um, mild hyperplasia, which is uh, generally orderly uh, with little risk of cancer. As long as it's orderly, there's little risk of cancer. But it can also go all the way to florid, atypical um, uh, hyperplasia with a greater risk commensurate with the severity and degree of atypia. So the higher the degree of atypia, the higher the risk of uh, malignancy. Um, grossly, really not, there is no distinctive feature to differentiate between um, non-peripherative and peripherative uh, fibrocystic disease. Um, but often the dominant feature is the fibrosis and cystic changes. Uh, microscopically, there is an infinite spectrum of peripherative alterations. We'll see some of them. The ducts, ductules and lobules may be filled with orderly uh, cuboidal cells within which small granular patterns may be seen or fenestrations or windows, if you like. There may be papillary um, ex excrescences, ductal papillomatosis. So all these things may, may be present at varying degrees, or you may just see a few of them uh, rather than the entire spectrum. And the degree of hyperplasia is manifested in part by a uh, number of layers of epithelial cells, and this can be mild, moderate, and severe. And usually when we report uh, on histology, then we try and grade it, uh, just so that the clinician uh, understands the degree of risk as well. And we, sh we shall see how that correlates with the risk for malignancy. And, and this is one such uh, image showing epithelial hyperplasia. Um, this duct is um, slightly mildly distended um, with the fenestrations that I was talking about, but the cells look pretty uniform. They don't look, uh, they, there's only mild uh, hyperchromasia um, or deep, deeper color of the nuclei. And the cells are within range of um, normality. Uh, so there isn't much nuclear pleomorphism. Um, and the cells are fairly small, uh, cuboidal, um, so nothing to worry about. So this would be uh, uh, mild 
hyperplasia with no atypia. This is an intraductal micropapillary proliferation. You can see this duct lined by cuboidal cells on the periphery. And within this mildly cystic uh, ductule is um, this uh, micropapillary proliferation, which also uh, is uh, fairly cellular with uh, these microfenestrations. Um, and then in, even in the neighboring uh, ducts, um, you can see some fenestrations. And then around the duct, you can see compressed stromal uh, fibrosis and a mild lymphocytic infiltration. Um, what, when do we say there is atypia? The hyperplastic cells are multi-layered and disorderly. This really is the key word. They are disorderly. The cells vary in size and, uh, and nuclear size, nuclear size and cell size as well as shape. So there is uh, a degree of uh, pleomorphism. Pleomorphism is variable uh, size and shape. Uh, there's nuclear hypochromasia. So the nuclei are darker than you'd expect in the normal uh, ductal epithelium. And the degree of atypia may approach uh, carcinoma in situ. And sometimes it, the distinction can be really a very thin line uh, between um, uh, severe dysplasia or severe atypia and carcinoma in situ. Uh, and here is uh, a microglandular formation with minimal atypia. So the cells are still fairly uniform, um, but um, there is a dilatation of the duct, so that it appears larger than normal. And you, you have the fenestrations, which give uh, the impression of microglandular uh, spaces. Um, with the tipia, remember we said the cells become uh, taller, columna, tall, columna, uh, or cuboidal and columna. Then some bridges, some nuclei are hyperchromatic. Um, and then you, you have this piling up, multi layering, which is not a good sign uh, of the nuclei. And um, with severe atypical epithelial hyperplasia, then you start to see mitotic figures, uh, multi-layering and disorderly arrangement of the um, epithelial cells in the duct. Um, the other form of atypical um, proliferative um, or changes is uh, in the lobules, so lobular hyperplasia. We talked about uh, ductal hyperplasia, but lobular hyperplasia also happens. Um, then you have hyperplasia of the terminal ductules and lobules. And cytologically, the cells resemble those of carcinoma in situ, but do not fill or distend more than 50% of the terminal duct unit or lobule. And there's an associated increased risk of invasive uh, carcinoma when there is significant atypia. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't always produce a discrete breast mass clinically. Um, so the nodularity present may be due to other changes. For example, if there's stromal, um, stromal um, increase in stromal fibrosis, all the cysts. So those are the ones that will, the changes that will produce nodularity. But the lobular hyperplasia or um, ductal hyperplasia in themselves do not um, produce a discrete mass, and yet they are the more important changes. Um, occasionally, we'll see microcalcifications on mammograms in fibrocystic disease, and uh, papillomatosis may produce a serous or serosanguineous nipple discharge. Uh, and when this happens, then you need to investigate. Uh, the other uh, variant or, or histological appearance of um, fibrocystic disease uh, under the proliferative category is sclerosing adenosis. And this is a change that is less common than cysts and hyperplasia. Uh, but the significance is the morphological pattern, which can deceptively be similar to carcinoma. And when you are starting out, 
as a first year in um, uh, in pathology um med you'll call this carcinoma very often and even later on in practice so one has to be careful that you don't mistake sclerosing adenosis um, for carcinoma uh, clinically presents as a hard rubbery uh, uh, lesion uh, consistency again very similar to what you'd feel or palpate in a cancer lesion uh, there is marked intralobular fibrosis with proliferation of small ducts and arsenide. And but fortunately, even though uh, histologically it looks a frightening lesion, it only has a minimal uh, risk for breast cancer. So, what uh, what is the relationship of fibrocystic uh, changes or fibrosis disease to breast cancer? Uh, the changes that have minimal or increased risk um, uh, include fibrosis, cystic changes, apocrine metaplasia, sclerosing adenosis, and mild hyperplasia. Slight increase in risk of one and a half to two times um, are those lesions that are moderate to florid hyperplasia and ductal papillomatosis. Significant uh, risk uh, of up to five times when there is atypical hyperplasia, either ductular or lobular. Proliferative lesions that are multifocal um, and um, have an increased risk across all the, these other three categories. And if there is a family history of breast cancer, then that increases the risk in all categories tenfold, particularly if there is atypical hyperplasia. Um, and only 5% of uh, biopsy specimens show uh, atypical hyperplasia. Therefore, the overall risk, because these are questions patients will ask you uh, one, when you discuss with them that their biopsy has shows atypical hyperplasia or a variety of any of these changes. You can assure them that the overall risk is small, 5%. But you have to remember the caveat, family history is important, increases tenfold the risk, and if there's atypical hyperplasia. So this is um, a photo micrograph um, from Ackerman's surgical pathology to show um, fast fibrocystic disease. You can see all these cystic spaces. Um, uh, there is somofibrosis, there is microcalcification, and in between, uh, and then of course there is atyp this duct shows atypical um, ductal uh, hyperplasia. And I think here it really goes all the way to, I couldn't enlarge this without it uh, going blurry, um, carcinoma in situ. And in between, if you look very carefully, you actually see an invasive, uh, ductal carcinoma. Yeah. So this is a ductal carcinoma arising in the background of fibrocystic disease. Um, so we leave that behind, fibrocystic disease. Uh, I think it's an interesting topic. Please read it, read up uh, some more. Let's now look at inflammatory lesions of the breast or mastitis and related lesions. Uh, fortunately, this tend to occur in just certain categories, so they are uncommon. Uh, during the acute phase, um, they may cause pain, which, which could be excruciating uh, pain and tenderness in the involved areas. Um, and good examples are mastitis and traumatic fat necrosis. So acute mastitis. Um, or acute inflammation on the breast develops when breast gain entry into breast tissue through the ducts or fissures in the nipple or where there is inspissation of secretions. And this generally occurs during the early weeks of uh, breastfeeding. Um, and therefore it's important to take a history uh, of lactation, pregnancy and lactation. 
Um, staphylococcal infection um, are some of the more common. They induce single or multiple abscesses, uh, usually small, small um, uh, micro abscesses. Um, when, when they are large, they heal with residue scarring, uh, giving rise to palpable induration. And therefore, this later on can be a, a clinical differential diagnosis of a neoplastic lesion. So again, beware, take a good history. There may be a past history of um, um, uh, breast abscess, which heals with scarring and induration. Streptococcal infection, uh, generally, unlike st staphylococcal infection that gives rise to focal, single or multiple abscesses, streptococcal rarely gives rise to micro abscesses. In ge generally, they cause uh, diffuse mastitis uh, and may involve the entire breast causing severe pain, marked swelling and tenderness. Um, and uh, rarely the resolution leaves residue in duration unlike staphylococcal infection. Uh, the other category of inflammatory disease is um, mammary ductectasia or simply ductectasia. Uh, you may see it referred to as periductal mastitis or plasma cell mastitis. And this is a non-bacterial inflammation of the breast. It's associated with inspissated um, uh, uh, secretions in the main secretory ducts. The ducts are dilated and rupture may lead to reactive changes in the breast uh, substance surrounding the ducts. Uh, fortunately, it is uncommon, um, often seen in women uh, who've had children in their 40s and 50s. Uh, so the older woman who has had uh, children and breastfeeding. Grossly, the inflammatory changes are confined to an area drained by one or several major excretory ducts of the nipple. Uh, there is increased firmness of the breast tissue in, in that area, and cut section shows dilated ducts from which you can squeeze or express thick, cheesy secretions. Um, and this is um, a photograph I found from uh, Ackerman Surgical Pathology. You can see this uh, dilated ducts, um, and some have uh, cheesy secretions uh, within them. Uh, microscopy, um, ductectasia, one sees uh, ducts that are filled with granular debris. Uh, there may be lots of leukocytes, mainly lipid laden macrophages, and often the epithelium lining the, the duct has been destroyed. And the most distinctive feature is the prominence of lymphocytic and plasma cell infiltration. And sometimes there may be granulomas in the periductal stroma. And that's why it's often referred to as plasma cell mastitis, because histologically, uh, a significant feature is uh, lots of plasma cells. Uh, there may be induration, um, skin, and nipple retraction. And these are changes that may mimic. Uh, cancer. They have the same clinical features, induration, skin, and nipple retraction. And this is a photomicrograph to show duct ectasia, um, so stromofibrosis, a ruptured duct, um, so that there's no lumen to speak of, uh, foamy macrophages, um, Recording this one in is progress. Somewhat more severe and diffuse, uh, and probably follows something that happened, uh, affected the entire breast, like a mastitis, for example. So let's look at tumors of the breast. We'll start with the benign tumors of the breast. The commonest one is fibroadenoma. And indeed, it is the commonest benign tumor of the female breast. Um, thought to occur due to an absolute or relative increase in estrogen, um, uh, but other, uh, other groups think that it's just uh, 
an exaggerated proliferation of uh, focal proliferation of breast tissue. Usually occurs in young women uh, with a peak in the third decade. So women in their 20s, um, 20 to about 35 years, that's really the peak age range, um, present as a discrete solitary nodule, freely mobile, and measures anywhere from one or less than one to, to 10 centimeters. Uh, more than 10 centimeters, then we refer to it as a giant fibroadenoma. Um, the, it may be solitary, it may be um, multiple you know, fibroadenomas in the same breast or bilateral. So some women, uh, young women will come with multiple lumps in the one breast or multiple lumps in both breasts, or you can have a solitary lump in each breast. So it may be bilateral, okay? Why it behaves like that, we are not really quite sure. Um, so this is um, the gross appearance of a fibroadenoma. You can see it has a sort of a thin fibrous capsule, um, or it gives the impression of a capsule, but it's really the compressed, um, compressed breast stroma. And then you have this is sort of slightly pink, uh, tissue stroma with dark uh, you know, spaces. Some of them may be slightly cystic, uh, but it shells out quite, quite well. Okay, this one is uh, one, two, three, four, maybe three, three and a half centimeters. Okay. Um, so firm, mobile, turn white, uh, to pinkish on the cut surface, punctuated by softer yellow specks uh, representing the glandular areas. We've seen that. And then microscopically um, comprises loose fibroblastic stroma and duct like epithelial line spaces of variable sizes and forms. And that's why the name fibro uh, referring to the stroma and adenoma, the glandular component. But Cytogenetic studies have shown that the stroma is the neoplastic element in this lesion, even though the name suggests that it is both. Um, it's actually the fibrous component that is neoplastic and the glandular spaces just go along with it. Fortunately, almost never become malignant unless the patient has other risk factors for breast cancer. Um, probably less than 0.1% um, um, of fibroadenomas will become malignant. I don't remember in my many years of um, surgical pathology practice seeing a breast cancer in a fibroadenoma. We see a lot in a lot more of cancer in fibrocystic disease, um, but fibroadenomas almost never um, that's what I'm not saying never, I'm saying almost never um, become malignant, okay? And here you can see the stroma component um, that is uh, compact. Sometimes it may be fibromyxoid. Uh, and then with this ductal spaces that may be cystic or compressed into this elongated branching uh, spaces. Um, a relative of fibroadenoma is the phylloidous tumor. It's much less common than the fibroadenoma and is thought to arise from the intralobular stroma um, and not from, the, from a pre-existing fibroadenoma, even though features, there may be some relationship, but they are totally different lesions. Um, Size-wise, they range from three to four centimeters to massive tumors that can distend the breast significantly. Some become lobulated and cystic. Um, grossly, um, they have um, this leaf-like clefts, uh, and hence the name phylogis, which is uh, Greek for leaf-like. Generally benign, but a few may be malignant. And in fact, we, we grade fibroid, um, um, phylloidous tumor, sorry, from uh, benign borderline 
uh, all the way to malignant. Um, luckily, majority are benign, but the ominous change um, in a phylloidist tumor clinically is uh, if there is, in, um, or histologically, increased stromocellarity with anaplasia, high mitotic uh, count, if it increases rapidly in size, and if histologically there is evidence of invasion into the surrounding breast tissue, then those are ominous changes. Fortunately, most are cured by excision, and it has to be wide excision with a good margin of normal tissue. Um, malignant lesions do recur, uh, particularly if there isn't wide enough excision, uh, and 15% uh, do present with distant metastasis. Um, uh, so we leave phylloidis tumor behind. I don't think I have a good picture, but um, I think you can look up some pictures of phylloidis tumor on the internet. But I can look. Um, I can look at uh, up and paste some uh, in this presentation before I share it. So intraductal papillomas are generally not considered uh, neoplastic. Um, they are papillary growths within a duct. Uh, most are solitary and occur in the principal lactiferous ducts or sinuses. If you remember, go to the first um, uh, image that I showed you of the microanatomy of the breast. Uh, and that's why they often present with serous or blood, bloody nipple discharge. Uh, or if they are further down in the um, uh, sinuses, or segmental ducts, then uh, they may present with a small subareola tumor, a few millimeters in diameter. Very rarely do they present with nipple retraction. So again, that's a differential diagnosis for nipple retraction, uh, intraductal papilloma. And, and here is a gross image of an intraduct with an intraductal papilloma. Here it appears as an nodule. Uh, but if you could magnify this, um, then you would see that it probably has uh, papillary excrescences. Um, this, this one measures about a centimeter, less than a centimeter uh, in diameter. Uh, so microscopic of uh, microscopy of intraductal papilloma, you can see the papillary excrescences um, lined by fairly uniform tall columnar cells. And of course, sometimes they bleed or secrete ser uh, serous fluid. And that's what the patient will come and tell you that they have a serous or bloody nipple discharge. And often the recommendation is, uh, yes, you'll do um, nipple cytology, uh, may or may not be diagnostic. And then you send the patient off for uh, a ductogram, then they can have a look in there. And if it's uh, present, they can nip it and we can give you a diagnosis. Here's another uh, intraductal papilloma. This one more complex uh, in the nipple. This is the nipple uh, that was excised in total because it's a large, more complex intraductal uh, papilloma. So we leave uh, non uh, benign neoplastic lesions of the breast uh, behind and look at breast cancer. Um, so we've already said that breast cancer is the commonest cancer among women globally. Uh, for us in Kenya, it's the same. Uh, and then just some years, breast uh, carcinoma of the cervix will be more common. Uh, it's the third, is, third commonest can, cancer overall um, uh, globally, so it's significant burden of disease. Um, I really should have updated this uh, figure. Uh, this is, I don't know why I missed that. Um, so I'll update this to, to current figures. Um, so my apologies. 
the incidence and death uh, um, appears to be increasing globally, even though we we have better diagnostic uh, capabilities and treatments. Uh, is still um, a serious disease with high mortality. Um, so what are the risk factors for breast cancer? They generally tend to divide, we tend to divide them into the well-established risk factors and less well-established. So the well-established risk factors uh, global, um, globally, there is geographical variation with significant uh, higher risk for women who live in North America and Northern Europe compared to women who live in Asia and Africa. Uh, and the US, for example, has up to five times higher figures than Japan. And it's been shown that when Japanese women move to North America, and live there for a significant number of years uh, and into the second generation, then they acquire the risk factor of their adopted um, geographical uh, relocation. So it must be some influence, environmental uh, influence, okay, rather than genetics um, that inform this uh, sort of statistics. Um, age, um, the breast cancer is uncommon below the age of 30. Not that it doesn't happen, it does. We've seen women as young as uh, 18 come in with um, uh, breast cancer, but it's very rare. Uh, and women in their early 20s, I think the youngest patient I ever saw with breast cancer was a 13 year old girl. That is juvenile uh, breast cancer, which is an entire a different category of disease. And the risk appears to increase with age. Uh, so it generally a disease of older women um, and genetics and family history play a role. Uh, prolonged exposure to endogenous estrogens, for example, those women who have um, active estrogen producing tumors like ovarian tumors, for example, their risk for breast cancer increases significantly. Uh, then pre-existing uh, proliferative um, breast disease with atypia, we've already seen that increases the risk significantly for breast cancer. So let's look at uh, genetics and family history. It appears that five to 10% breast cancer is related to specific inherited mutations so the germline mutations in tumor suppressor gene, the P53, underlie patients who have um, some cancer syndromes like the Lee Fromeni syndrome, uh, which uh, makes women with this syndrome at risk of developing several cancers before the age of 40, uh, which may be often bilateral, for example, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and so on. For women with the BRCA1 gene, 50% uh, uh, risk of breast cancer before the age of 50 and a whooping 65% by the age of 65. Um, the BRCA2 gene, which is uh, domiciled on chromosome 13, is thought to be responsible for 10 to 15% of familial breast cancer. Do you know which uh, famous actress uh, had uh, the BRCA1 gene and opted for bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. Anyone? Anyone in the class? No? Oh, they've written Angelina oh, Jolie. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so yeah, so her, the, the story was her mother died very early, I think before the age of 60 of breast cancer. So she opted to go for testing and she, she had a BRCA1 gene 
and she opted for breast prophylactic breast mastectomy because then she had a, a very high risk of breast, 50% chance of breast uh, cancer before the age of 50. Uh, I think we also, in one of the conferences we had locally, there was also uh, a woman in the audience. She was a patient who, who said she would had also opted for a prophylactic mastectomy. Because uh, she also had uh, a very, she didn't get tested, but she had a very strong family history. I think her mom, her sister, her grandmother, very, very strong family history of breast cancer. So she opted for prophylactic mastectomy rather than sit there and wait to also die from breast cancer. Uh, less well established risk factors uh, prolonged exposure to exogenous estrogen, such as women who opt to have a hormone replacement therapy, uh, to delay uh, features of aging, for example, uh, long oral contraceptive use, estrogen secreting ovarian tumors. Uh, you remember which, which tumor specifically may secrete estrogen? Anyone? Uh, tell me, I don't want to go to the chat. Oh, I can look. Anyone remember from last week's lecture? Yes, granulosa cell tumors, active ones. Eh? Um, uh, so obesity, um, uh, women who have rapid growth and greater adult height, particularly like Scandinavian women uh, who are the tallest women in the world have also one of the higher risk for breast cancer. Obesity, what is the relationship between obesity and the risk for breast cancer? Anybody know? Anybody know? What is the risk, the relationship? No, it's not increased cholesterol, but a good try. Anybody else? Mm, yeah, obesity is increased risk, increased fat. Um, it's not about increasing, yeah, uh, Stanley Mugadi, you're right. Uh, Estrogen is stored in fat, yes. Um, uh, um, so no, it's not impaired immunity. Is uh, that fat uh, stores estrogen, and then you have a huge store of um, endogenous estrogens. So you you end up with the uh, the same almost a similar situation as if you are taking exogenous estrogen. So that is the 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 explanation. Uh, greater adult height, um, I'm not quite sure what the explanation is. Um, alcohol consumption, cigarette smoking, you all know the relationship between alcohol and cigarette smoke to um, neoplastic processes. <clears throat> and then a dietary, a high fat diet uh, would give rise to similar explanation with obesity, uh, increase in and uh, endogenous stores of estrogen. So um, clinically, it's for some reason that nobody has uh, quite uh, told us. Uh, breast cancer appears to be more common in the left breast than the right. Uh, about 4% of women will have bilateral tumors or sequential tumors in the same breast. I think that's really unfortunate. 
um, I remember uh, um, this young woman, she was young, 27 years. Um, she took a matatu from Kirogoya, came for the, to the FNA clinic. Um, I did, I, so I examined her, she had fairly small breasts. I examined her, she indeed had um, a breast lump in one breast uh, with auxiliary nodes on the other breast, the contralateral breast. Then I carefully examined the other breast and she had bilateral tumors. Uh, it, so I did FNA in both breast lumps and the axilla. So she had late stage disease at the age of 27, bilateral tumors already with metastasis at presentation. Um, so we generally classify breast cancer into ductal and lobular carcinoma and invasive or in situ carcinomas, but of course the uh, other variants. So intraductal um, carcinoma uh, occurs or at presentation we see in 20 to 25% of breast cancers, uh, intraductal carcinoma with Paget's disease, and you can have lobular carcinoma in situ. This is non-invasive, but um, not something we see often. In invasive breast cancer, um, more than 70% of cases are invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, then you can have invasive carcinoma with ductal carcinoma with Paget's disease, invasive lobular carcinoma, medullary carcinoma uh, accounts for about 1%, uh, mucinous or colloid carcinoma tubular carcinoma and other rare types like micro papillary carcinomas, uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, and mixed, mixed tumors, um, a whole variety of tumors, metaplastic carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, then of course you have non-epithelial uh, non tumors like lymphomas uh, um, and sarcomas of the breast, and those are very, very rare. So the invasive ductal carcinoma is the commonest form of breast cancer, clinically deceptively, deceptively discrete mass. So it may give, for example, if it occurs in a young woman, 27, like the one I gave it, the clinical presentation is almost like, um, a fibroadenoma, and then it's in the same age group, so it can be deceptive. Then of course, with extension of growth, then you have dimpling of the skin to give the appearance of um, an orange peel skin, which in French, they call it peau d'orange uh, appearance, orange peel appearance, uh, nipple retraction, fixation of the mass to the chest wall, uh, and then histologically, um, you have nests uh, or cords of uh, large tumor cells with variable fibrous stroma. Um, mitosis are variable. And when we grade the tumor, we actually count the number of mitosis because it's important for prognostication. And whether there is um, perineural or perivascular uh, invasion. Uh, by the tumor. Paget's disease of the breast is an unusual form of breast cancer, affects slightly older women, and often begins as an intraductal carcinoma. There may be a palpable mass, but often uh, it involves the skin, which may be fissured and ulcerated, oozing, hyperemia, resembling eczema, and there may be superinfection. And the hallmark of Paget's disease of the nipple is um, uh, invasion of the epidermis by large hyperchromatic tumor cells that have abundant clear cytoplasm, but clinically behaves as a ductal carcinoma. Often there is an underlying um, carcinoma, ductal carcinoma of the breast. Um, common features of all invasive uh, carcinomas of the breast, fixed mass to the skin, 
or chest wall, fascia and pectoral muscle, lymphedema, which is exaggeration of hair follicles with thickening of the skin, the orange peel appearance, or in French, peau d'orange um, appearance, peau is skin of orange, orange skin appearance, microclassification on x-ray in 60 to 80% of breast cancers, and nodal metastasis may be present in up to two thirds of women at the time of diagnosis. Um, prognostic factors for breast cancer, the size of the tumor. So we always measure the tumor. If it's less than two centimeters, it's early disease. Um, up to five centimeters, uh, then it's a, sort of an intermediate grade and more than five centimeters. Um, and then you're talking about late stage disease. Uh, lymph node involvement uh, is part of the prognostication or staging of the tumor. The histological type is important. Some tumors, uh, some histological types are less aggressive than other types. Uh, hormone receptor uh, markers, estrogen and progesterone, and then uh, overexpression of um, the HER2 uh, gene. Um, aneuploidy and angiogenesis, the presence of proliferation of new blood vessels has been shown to be important in terms of prognosis. So this is um, some photomicrographs of uh, cytological uh, samples, final aspiration. Um, so hypercellular, um, markedly pleomorphic, uh, ductal cells, variable in size and shape and uh, hyperchromatic. Uh, and similarly here, um, and in the right hand side image, you can see almost um, a background, um, background mucoid secretion. So this is most likely a uh, uh, colloid, so-called colloid carcinoma or mucinous carcinoma of the breast. Um, so on the left is a ductal carcinoma. You can see uh, very large cells, variable in shape and size and hyperchromatic, uh, sort of loosely cohesive. But on the right hand side is a benign apocrine metaplasia. So the, if you look carefully, the nuclei are pretty uniform in size. They have abundant cytoplasm. This is a discrete nucleolus, um, but generally uniform compared to the cells on the right. So this is a final aspiration uh, of a benign as well as a malignant breast lesion. Um, Introductal carcinoma, uh, that is introductal confined to a duct. Okay, you can see the uh, fibrous connective tissue and the basement membrane. And the duct is distended by a multi-layering of um, cuboidal cells, not much pleomorphism, but generally um, the multi-layering, these are too many cells distending the duct and the central necrosis, what we refer to as comedal necrosis. Uh, com Comedo appearance, like the brooch um, that you wear on your lapel uh, with uh, a jewel in the middle, um, sort of that sort of appearance, that's what we call comedo. Um, and um, intracystic papillary carcinoma, this is one of the more rare variants of, of uh, breast cancer. And you can see this duct that is distended by this cauliflower uh, tumor um, with cystic spaces. And the histology shows these tall columnar cells lining this papillary uh, or finger-like projections, okay? A rare tumor, we don't see it very often. And they can be very aggressive. Um, Microscopy of an infiltrating duct carcinoma. You can see the large cells in these nests that are infiltrating the stroma, okay, with microgranular spaces. 
Um, mucinous carcinoma, mucinous because it's secreting mucin. Okay, sometimes there's a lot of mucin in the background and cells are just floating uh, in the mucin, mucinous secretion. Um, so this is an infiltrating mucinous carcinoma. Tends to have a slightly better prognosis than the common garden type of ductal carcinoma. Uh, radio scar of an infiltrating carcinoma. You can see this sort of rugged, radiating white tumor in the breast. And you can see um, uh, the um, fibrous strands and your and, and, and your new blood vessels, um, ducts in the middle, and then this white tumor, irregular. Uh, radiating like from a central place in, in that sort of crab-like um, appearance. Intravascular tumor embolus. So this is a um, vascular space. It could be a lymphatic or blood vessel, and then you have a tumor embolus. So there's intravascular uh, disease. Uh, metastatic tumor in a lymph node. This has been stained with immuno histochemistry for estrogen receptors to show a nest of tumor cells in this lymph node, okay? So this is one way we can demonstrate a small tumor focus in a lymph node, or if you're not sure where the primary is um, and you stain for estrogen um, in immunohistochemistry, then it lights up like this and confirms the breast as a primary uh, for this tumor. Paget's disease of the nipple, remember we said that uh, it may be uh, very innocent looking in terms of clinical presentation, almost like an eczema, okay, just um, a fish at nipple with crusting, uh, red and angry looking, um, looking like an inflammatory lesion. And then histology shows these large tumor cells within the epidermis. And of course, there's hyperkeratosis uh, on the surface. And most likely underneath here will be a ductal carcinoma. Uh, immunohistochemistry to show the malignant tumors, um, nests of malignant tumors within the epidermis. Okay. Um, this is immunohistochemistry with, for estrogen receptors and just shows the tumor. Uh, cells lighting up uh, in this manner, okay? So immunohistochemistry can be very useful in showing, um, confirming a diagnosis of Paget's disease. So this is a short answer question um, that I'll just decide to give you so that you can think about possible questions as you're reading and revising and, and having your discussions what sort of questions we might ask, for example, on the breast pathology. Um, so list five clinical symptoms and signs of breast disease for five marks. What are the possible differential diagnoses of a breast lump in a 25-year-old female? Briefly discuss the histologic classification of breast cancers. I've covered that. And what tumor markers are useful in the diagnosis and prognostication of breast cancer? Mm. So this would be a big question, okay? But with multiple um, short answers, okay? Any question? Oh. Um, yes, and the, the last, my last comment is that there are excellent parts of breast pathology in the museum. I'll ask Robert to put them out uh, for you. Um, then you can have a look. Yes. Uh, thank you, Prof. Mm -hmm. Recording stuff. We stopped. have a class uh, immunology.